السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء محمد بن عبد الله صلى عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا إن شاء الله I shall be speaking about the final two surahs of the Quran Surah Al-Falaq and Surah Al-Nas Now we very commonly know them as Al-Mu'awwithatayn the two protective surahs So first and foremost I want us to understand why we call it Mu'awwithatayn why we call them both collectively Mu'awwithatayn and this takes us to a story back 1400 years ago in the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This is talking around about seven years after Hijri, seven years after the Muslims migrated from Makkah to Medina, just after Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And it begins when Rasul had a, a khadim, as we call it, a, a worker for him that used to work around his house. And this, this young man was Jew. He was a, he was a Jew. And Prophet, Prophet trusted him. He really trusted him. So he allowed him in his house. He allowed him to do the work in his house. And he, you know, what happened was this, this young man was approached by an enemy of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This enemy being Labid bin Asam. Now Labid bin Asam outwardly and he showed, he tried to show to the people that he was a Muslim. He said that he had accepted Islam. He had, taken, you know, he had Iman inside him, but this was a lie. He was a hypocrite. He had no Iman inside him. He was an enemy of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he sought to destroy Islam from within. So he approached this young man, this young Jewish boy, and he said to him, I need you to do something. He goes, I need you to go into the house of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and steal just a few items. This boy didn't know what he was getting himself into. So, you know, he kept on pushing and pushing and pushing and finally this young boy gave in. So this young boy went into the house of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he stole these few items. These few items were just a comb of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and a few strands of his hair. So now he's taken it, he's given it to Labid bin Asam. Now Labid bin Asam was not only a hypocrite, a munafiq, but he was also a magician. He also practiced black magic. So what he did is he got this comb, he got the strands of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hair, and he tied knots, 11 knots, through the, the teeth of this comb. And then after he did that, he got the comb, he covered it in a, in a cloth, a piece of cloth, went to a well, went inside the well, and he found a rock, put the, this cloth and this, the, the, the teeth of this comb and these strands of hair underneath this rock, and he left it there and went off. Now for six months, this caused pain to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Six months, agonizing pain. And it wasn't just pain that he felt. It was, he had another problem. This problem was that he would have, and I stress this, only fleeting thoughts. He would have these moments where he would forget certain things. And this, this was specifically to the fact that he thought he had spent time with one of his wives when he hadn't. But it only affected that part of his memory. It did not affect him in conveying the message of Islam. So now for six months, Rasulullah is having these problems. He's having this pain. And then one day, Aisha radiallahu anha relates that Rasulullah came to her and he said, Allah has answered, answered me for that which I asked from him. And she goes, what has happened? And Rasul says that he had a dream. Now we must remember that the dreams of the prophets are not just dreams. They are wahi. They are divine revelation. And it's just like in the story of Ibrahim salam, when he had a dream that he was commanded to slaughter his own son. He knew, you know, this wasn't a dream that he wanted to see. But it was divine revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he knew he had to carry that out. So this was the same, this was a, a dream that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what happened in this dream is that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was lying down. And by his feet there was a man and by his head there was another. 
And these weren't just men, these were angels. The one by his head was Jibreel alayhi salam, and the one by his feet was Mikhail alayhi salam. Now one of the angels said to the other, what's wrong with him? What's happened to him? And the other replied, he is mathboob. He has had sorcery done upon him. Someone has done black magic upon him. And he, the other replied to, they said to him, who cast the spell? So the other replied, Labid bin Aqsan. Then he asked, how did he do it? And he explained that he got this comb and he tied the knots inside the, co the, the teeth of this comb. And then he finally asked, where has he placed it? And the angel told him that he has placed it in this certain well under this rock. So Rasul having seen this dream, he called his companions, specifically Ali radiallahu anhu. And he told them, go to this well and find this comb for me. When he asked them to do so, he also followed with them. And when one of the companions had gone inside the well and got the comb, they gave it to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And now the final part of this dream comes, where one of the angels asks, how, what is the cure for this? And the angel said to him that, recite, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الفلق and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ The two final surahs of the Qur'an. So then Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam gets this comb, and as he unties each knot, he recites one of the, the verses of, this, of these surahs. So he begins by saying, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الفلق and then مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ and so on and so forth, until all 11 knots had been untied. And as soon as the last knot had been untied, he felt relieved. He felt that the pressure had been off him finally. Now remember, Rasul went through six months of agonizing pain because of this. Six months. He knew exactly who had cast this spell on him. He knew exactly how it had happened. He knew who also helped in this. But he took no action against them. This is the Prophet that we should be following. A Prophet of mercy. He could have done anything he wished. He had companions that would do anything he asked from him. But he did not do anything. And this is the example that we should follow. A Prophet of mercy. So now that we know why it is called, why the two surahs are collectively called Mu'awwidatayn, we go on and begin Surah Al-Falaq. Now, to differentiate between these two surahs, yes, they are 11 verses collectively, but they are two very different surahs in their content. So in Surah Al-Falaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about external evils. External evils talking about evils in the outside world that we should be protecting ourselves from. So things that are other than ourselves. We do not talking about the harms that we cause ourselves, but the harm that others can cause us. And that will only have effect in our dunya. So he begins by saying, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the daybreak. Now why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begin, be, uh, begun by saying falaq? Now falaq literally means to split. And he said daybreak. Well, we take it as daybreak. And the daybreak is when, is what splits the darkness from the light. Is when we wake up to pray Fajr and then afterwards we see the sun rise and that's when we know darkness has gone and light has come. And to show the importance of night and day and light and darkness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran very beautifully puts it when he describes darkness as evil. He mentions in the Quran, Inna shirk that in, indeed shirk is a great darkness. And then when he talks about nur and when he talks about light, he talks about the Quran. He talks about the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he talks about himself, Allahu Nurus Samawati Wal Ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And then he also says, Mina Dhulumati Ila Nur from darkness to light. So he shows a very huge comparison between darkness and light and what is evil and good. And then he goes on to say, Min Sharri Ma Khalaq. From the evil of that which he has created, not the evil that he has created. Because we cannot associate evil with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. He's Al Ghafur. We can't associate evil with him. We can't say that it is because of Allah all these evil things happen. You know, if someone comes up to you and hits you, you and you can't just say, you know, you can't just give an excuse saying that, oh Allah put this evil inside me and he, you know, he made me hit you. 
That's not an excuse we can give because we create the evil ourselves. Allah does not create pure evil. And then the next three verses speak about what specific evils we should be asking protection from. So the next verse is وَمِن شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ from the evil of from the evil of the dark night when it penetrates. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here the dark night. In the night most crimes happen. Most sin is takes place. People go out clubbing, people go out drinking, crime, people go robbing houses at night. All this crime, most of it happens at night time. And even Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us and he has commanded us to take our children in before it becomes dark. Because he himself knew that bad things happen at night. And also to connect this with the next few verses, witchcraft and sorcery also take, has its most power and has its strongest effect at night time. So then Allah says, وَمِن شَرِّ النَّفَّاثَاتِ فِي الْعُقَدِ and from the evil of the blowers in knots. This refers right back to the story that we started off with when Labid bin Asim tied the knots around the comb. And Allah is telling us to seek protection from these, the, uh, these sorcerers. Now when we think about you know, magic and stuff, a lot of people, the first thing that will come to their mind is most likely Harry Potter, you know, you're talking about Hogwarts and whatnot. It's the first thing that comes to people's mind, you know, wizards with robes and... But these people are not what we perceive them as. They could be completely normal people. So these sorcerers, and it could be people in our own families, but Allah is giving us a way to seek protection from them all. And then in the final verse of this surah, Allah tells us why these people do such an evil act. And he says, وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِذٍ إِذَا حَسَدٍ from the evil of the envious when he envies. The whole reason why people practice black magic and do these evil things to others is because they are jealous, because they envy others. It was, it's such a grave sin that it was the first sin committed in the heavens when Iblis himself said that I will not bow down to someone who is created from mud and clay. You know, he envied him. He said, I'm made of fire. Why can't they bow down to me? There is jealousy. There is envy. That was the first sin committed in the heavens. And the first sin committed in the dunya was also jealousy, out of jealousy. When Qabil killed Habil, he did it out of jealousy. So it shows the grave act, you know, what this, this grave sin can lead to. And jealousy doesn't always have to be a bad thing. If we see someone with something good, it doesn't mean automatically we, see, we start thinking bad things about this person. No, if you see someone who is, you know, strong in their deen, who, you know, Allah has given, you know, more wealth than you, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed with more things than you, you shouldn't look at that person and say, why has Allah given that person this? Why hasn't Allah given me all this? I deserve it. I work harder. Are we really going to question the Qudrat of Allah? Are we going to question the power of Allah and what He wills to do? If we see a person with something that we wish for, first of all say, MashaAllah, Allah has gifted this thing to this person. And then second of all, if you wish for that thing, wish for it for yourself, but also do not wish that anything less, anything is taken from that person and this person deserves any less. So these are the, the lessons that we learn from this surah alone. For the, so the first one being the evil of the dark night. The second, the evil of black magic. The third, the evil of jealousy and the evil eye. And finally, that we should only seek protection in Allah alone. I know a lot of us have this thing that, you know, as soon as we see something bad happening to someone in our family, the first thing we'll do is run to, you know, a chef or something and be like, you know, this has happened and this has happened. You know, we need your help. But we forget who is the protector of mankind? Who is our ultimate protector? Who do we first and foremost go to for protection? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.